that's my question today. Is global inequality really falling? Um, cut to the chase. This is the stylized fact that I'm going to question today. This is um, one of many possible graphs showing, showing exactly the same thing one can construct, construct from the data. What is it showing? Um, overall fall since about 1990 in global inequality. Global inequality is defined as pooling all people in the world, forgetting where they live, and constructing an inequality measure on that distribution. Falling since 1990. Now, important to note, it was rising back to 1820, for a long-run trend increase. So that's a significant change. What is driving it, driving it, for approximate reason, was, was um, uh, falling inequality between countries. As you see here, I've given a decomposition, this is a decomposable inequality index, um, into between country and within country. So this is all well known in the literature, but um, declining inequality between countries. Inequality within countries, it's not, not obvious, entirely obvious there, but it is drifting upwards. Um, in the developing world uh, alone, so taking out the rich world, the picture is somewhat similar, but it's got this interesting feature that it's starting to tick up. Um, that's the developing world only. So clearly that's been driven by China passing through the mean for the developing world as a whole. China, for a long time, was bringing down global inequality through the between-country component, and now it's increasing global inequality because of its, its mean is above the mean for the developing world. For the developing world, but you can kind of ignore that picture because I want to focus on the world as a whole. Within some countries, we're seeing rising inequality somewhat dramatically, um, maybe half of the developing world. People think it's rising everywhere, it's not maybe a bit more than half an hour. Uh, Indonesia is an interesting case because it was on a downward trend or was stable for a long period. Indonesia is now seeing rising inequality on a, on a trend that will basically reach uh, Brazil within 10 years. I'm not claiming that will happen. There will be mitigating forces coming into play and there is some sign that they're already doing that. But so you see the picture. But the question today, is this stylized fact robust to how we measure poverty, inequality? That's an almost Freudian slip on my part. But, um, I'm going to look at three things. One thing I'm not going to do, I'm going to stick to what I call, the, what others call the cosmopolitan approach. Um, I'm not going to say that foreigners are worth less than people within your country. Right? I'm going to stick to a cosmopolitan approach which treats people as people wherever they may live. And I, I'm going to do that as an ethical starting point. Um, I'm going to look at three things. An easy one, Lorentz dominance. Is this, when we say inequality is falling in the world, do we have Lorentz dominance? Second, what about relative, uh, absolute versus relative inequality? And third, and this is the, going to be the, the harder one, what about relative deprivation? Lorentz dominance, easy answer, we don't have Lorentz dominance. We have intersection Lorentz curves over the long run, over quite a, most sub-periods too. In other words, if you have a sufficiently strong ethical aversion to inequality, you will say inequality is increasing. What does sufficiently strong mean? Um, if you know the Atkinson inequality measure, it means an Atkinson parameter over five. I think most people would say, answer to, in, in, in answering the question, is, is the rise in inequality, falling inequality robust? They'd probably say reasonably robust in that case. It requires a, quite a high Atkinson parameter, but, but duly noted, it's not, we don't have Lorentz dominance. There are inequality measures which will show an increase. Absolute versus relative. Now, this is uh, slightly more subtle. We have an inequality measurement, the scale independence axiom. Multiply all incomes by a constant, doesn't change the inequality measure. Uh, the problem is, m most people don't seem to agree with that. At least most students don't. And here's a survey I did of uh, nearly 400 students at Georgetown. It's a selected sample. It's all the students who come to my course. Um, and it, it corroborates things that Frank Carl, Emile, and others have, have found in the past. A um, majority of people do not accept scale independence. In other words, if I show them distributions like this, mm -hmm. one, two, three, two, four, six, a uh, majority, a bit over 50%, majority think that inequality has increased. Actually, most of the other axioms look fine. The standard inequality axioms, like the Pigou Dalton principle, uh, where's that? Uh, that's this one here, making a transfer from the 
uh, rich to the poor. They, they agree that's inequality um, decreasing in that case. But it's really the scale independence axiom that's contentious. Um, so let's see what happens if you relax it. Bang. If instead I use the Colm's absolute Gini index, here I've used numbers from um, Atkinson and Brandolini. I've, I've had constructed similar and more recent numbers, same pattern. Um, absolute Gini index is rising globally. Relaxed scale independence. And what does that mean? It means that I'm going to measure inequality by the absolute gaps between the rich and the poor, not the proportionate gaps. Here's another way of looking at it, the uh, Lackner milanovic elephant graph. This is a quote, uh, growth incidence curve for the world, uh, percentiles on the horizontal axis, uh, proportionate changes on the vertical axis. And you see this pattern, there's been much discussion of this, it's got a lot of play in the literature and the media as well. Um, that's all relative. This is what the growth, what the elephant curve looks like in absolute terms. Those are the absolute gains on the vertical axis against percentiles of the distribution. It's massively absolute inequality increasing. And we don't really know how, how, how bad it is up here. Um, I'll come back to that. Uh, one aspect of this that's, that's really striking to me is what's happening at the bottom. Well, you saw already in the developing world, it's no, very little progress right at the bottom of the distribution. We're seeing near zero gains at the bottom, uh, rising absolute inequality. Another way of looking at it, this is a, a somewhat difficult measurement issue, how to measure the, the, the lowest level of living in the world. Um, these are my estimates, the blue line. Uh, this is my estimate of the, um, it's a weighted mean of all incomes below the poverty line with highest weight on the poorest people. Um, that, that weighted mean is, is pretty much constant. It's a very small increase. And yet we've seen this dramatic increase in the growth rate in the developing world from roughly 2% to 4% turning, with a turning point around uh, the year 2000. Okay. Um, and this is the similar picture for Indonesia. A little bit more progress for Indonesia in raising the floor than for the developing world as a whole. I want to go to this third issue, which um, is a bit more difficult. Um, when we think about, when we measure in, in inequality, income inequality from surveys, we're making some pretty strong assumptions about how we measure real income. And there are obvious inadequacies. And one of the inadequacies is, is about the coverage and the time period, or second is the time period. The coverage of surveys in terms of time periods are typically relatively short, so we're not capturing or getting a longer-term view of living standards. Uh, and, and another aspect is, is, is the consumption of non-market goods. Uh, if you get benefits in kind, like um, food stamps in the United States, um, those benefits in kind are not included in your income measure. So there are a number of well-known inadequacies in how we measure incomes. I want to address those in a particular way. Um, just to get a, 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 an inroad into this question. It's not ideal, but it gives us a, a, a quick answer to the, the robustness question. Well, the first point you could make is, okay, I, um, I may be cosmopolitan, but I, I can be nationalistic. What does that mean? That I care about relative deprivation within the country I live in. In the extreme case, suppose I, my real income or my welfare, economic welfare depends only on my relative income. That's an extremely nationalistic position. If you take that position, then obviously global inequality is just average inequality across countries, and we've seen already it's rising. Okay, so there we've got a, a non-robustness, obviously. But wait a sec, who's no, how could you think of own welfare depending only on relative income? It surely depends also on absolute level of income. So I want to encompass this uh, within a perspective that allows both negative and positive effects of mean income on your standard of living, given your own income. Now, we always allow that mean income depend, influences your standard of living through your own income. But that, if we assume it only matters through your own income, we're making quite a strong exclusion restriction. Why? Because of the reasons I mentioned. Survey data are incomplete. We've got missing aspects of income, like uh, benefits from in-kind benefits. There are many other reasons too. Living in a richer country benefits you in many ways. So relative deprivation, the idea that I've, I'm, I'm poorer 
if I'm living in, in, a, in a welfare sense, I'm poor if I'm living in a rich country at a given level of income because of relative, relativist considerations. Working against that, we have a lot of arguments which are just quite pos strong positive external effects, benefits of living in a, a richer country that aren't evident in the income measures we're using. So let's encompass that within a, a very simple, in a very simple way. Um, log adjusted income is going to be log own income plus some weight attached to the mean income of the country you live in. Now I want, to ask, I want to ask how robust are the statements we make about global inequality to the choice of alpha? Now if you're a relative deprivation person, um, some people argue this, uh, if you're a relative deprivation person you think alpha is minus one. All that matters is your relative income. In this case logged it, but you can see, the, you see that. If I believe that living in a richer country gives me higher welfare for any of those reasons that I mentioned, you think alpha is positive. If we look at su subjective welfare, which is one of the few clues we've got, and unfortunately most of the literature on subjective welfare is useless from this point of view, good from many points of view, but useless from this point of view, because people either look at, social, at subjective welfare across countries, or they look at subjective welfare within countries. If you do it within countries, almost every time you'll find evidence of relative deprivation. In other words, people, people's subjective welfare responds to their relative position. That appears to be uncontentious now. But what about national income? Well, we can't, uh, within country studies not going to help. Between country studies are not going to help either. We need studies which pool all people of the world looking at their subjective welfare, and then we look at whether national income matters to your own subjective welfare, given your own income. You do that, you get a positive effect. The alpha, mm. I'm going to just claim that, you're going to have to believe me, the alpha is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5. Way, way higher than minus one. In other words, a, with a, uh, the, uh, a national income matters to your welfare um, with an elasticity of about uh, 0.3 to 0.5. But don't, you don't have to believe me on that, because I think you know, we don't have a lot of evidence here. So again, I'm going to be fairly encompassing. Measures of inequality, thanks Clive. Measures of inequality I'm going to naturally use. If you see my, my log specification, it's going to be obvious that I'm going to want to use MLD, mean log deviation. Uh, we also know it has a lot of nice properties. There's a, a beautiful paper by Frank Carl and Emmanuel Flacher on the properties of MLD. Um, very cute. Okay, so MLD, we've got standard properties of MLD, but this time MLD is going to have a parameter alpha, this thing, somewhere between minus one and plus one. Here's my adjust in my ordinary MLD, it's decomposable the same way. And the MLD that you're probably used to is alpha equals zero. The properties of the measure, um, well, one, one obvious thing is that the within, since we're essentially what we're doing is scaling up all incomes by a constant within a given country, Obviously, the within-country component of inequality is not going to change. Everything's going to be on the between-country component. The other thing is that you've got a strong monotonicity property. You can prove that this measure that I've shown you is increasing in alpha. The higher the level of alpha, the higher the MLD, as long as the means vary across countries. What do we find? Data galore. Cut to the chase. This is the picture. I've done it for between 1993 and 2012. This is alpha. This is global inequality. So the answer to my question, well, it's not robust. Well, we knew that because I could always go to relative deprivation. I could always argue that all I care about is relative deprivation, which means it's non-robust. But the answer to this is saying you have to be essentially very, very nationalistic. You have to actually have an alpha less than minus 0.6 before you claim that that global inequality is rising. Very robust. Um, the interval I talked about was 0.3 to 0.5. Now, the other thing to note about this, the magnitude of the effect. One way of looking at it is you know, we've got a lot of literature now on, on getting better, better measures of incomes of the rich. Suppose that I'm underestimating incomes of the rich, uh, that, that really they're double, 1%. Let's take the top 1%. And let's suppose that their incomes are actually double what I see in the data. That would add 0.1 to the global MLD. That's like adding a tiny little weight on national income, small positive weight. We're seeing, we're seeing really large impacts. The way you see that in the picture, 
look at the zero for either year and look at the impact on MLD of allowing for even small positive values of alpha. This swamps the problems we've been all worried about. <laughs> Just putting a small positive weight on national income in your welfare metric at given own income, you get substantially larger global inequality, but still falling. Okay, conclusions. The claim that uh, global uh, relative inequality is falling is, is, is not robust, but the degree of non-robustness is, is, is important here, I think. You need very high ethical aversion to inequality, I would judge. But, you know, if that's, we, I don't have a, any way of saying that your inequality aversion uh, isn't over, point fi over 5 in the Atkinson parameter, so that's entirely possible. It's clearly not robust to relaxing scale independence, big time, not robust. So there it's clear. Uh, not robust to, to allowing for a relative deprivation, that's clear, but it requires an implausible degree of nationalism. Nationalistic measure has to be, I believe, quite remarkably high to reverse the conclusion. Thank you.